In February of 2017, Peg and I, along with our friends John, Holly, and Aki, took a princess cruise consisting of five days on the Malaysian Peninsula, followed by 11 days visiting other countries in Southeast Asia. The cruise began in Singapore with the ship proceeding north along the coast of Malaysia, visiting Kuala Lumpur, Penang, and Phuket, Thailand. After returning to Singapore, we started the second phase of our journey, visiting Koto Kanabalu, Malaysia, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, then by air to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, followed by a flight to Bangkok, where we rejoined the cruise and had a final stop at Koh Samui, Thailand. In these videos, we will share our observations, impressions, and in some cases our amazement at the people, the culture, the architecture, and the unique character of this part of the world. Our story begins in Singapore, which is an island state on the southern tip of Malaysia, just 85 miles north of the equator. It consists of 62 islands and covers only 277 square miles. With a population of 4 million, it is one of the most stable, financially successful, attractive, and law-abiding cities in the world. It's a melting pot of cultures with four official languages, Malay, Chinese, English, and Tamil. The major faiths are Buddhism, Taoism, Islam and Christianity, and everyone lives together in peace. The history of Singapore goes back to 1300 when it was established as a trading post. It went through a series of rulers including local sultans followed in the 1500s by the Portuguese and later the Dutch. Its rise to prominence began in 1819 when Thomas Raffles of the British East India Company signed a treaty with the local sultan to develop it as a trading post. By 1860, Singapore had become a rubber exporting center with a population of 80,000. It continued as a British colony until 1963 when it became part of the Malaysian Federation. But in 1965, it left the Federation and became an independent state that has thrived as a technology and trading center. Our journey began with a flight from the U.S. through Seoul, South Korea, arriving in Singapore at 3 a.m. having traveled 30 hours. After just a few hours of rest, we boarded a bus into the city and got our first impressions of Singapore. What we saw was a clean, modern city with manicured landscape, drivers who obey traffic laws, and a metropolis of awesome architecture where skyscrapers are mixed with older two-story districts and green space. Arriving at the pier, we found that even the embarkation building was ultra-modern and designed to resemble a cruise ship. After getting settled in our cabin, we went outside on deck and viewed the city skyline. The most impressive building is the Marina Bay Sands. It consists of three 50-story buildings with a ship supported across the top. It is an $8 billion casino hotel convention center that was built in 2010. It has 2,500 rooms, a skating rink, the world's largest atrium, and the ship on top, which is a 340 meter long sky park with a reflecting pool and is the world's largest public cantilevered platform. The other must-see landmark is the Mer Lion, a fountain sculptured with a lion's head and the body of a fish. The fish pays tribute to Singapore's ancient history as a sea town and the lion gives reference to a lion-like animal that was seen by a visiting prince, Sang Nila Utama, in 1299, and gives Singapore its name, the Lion City. Our itinerary included two additional days in Singapore. The first day we visited the River Safari at the Singapore Zoo and saw aquatic life from around the world. 
From the Mississippi, we saw the alligator gar that can grow over 10 feet long, and the paddlefish whose eggs are sold as caviar. From the Congo, we saw the dwarf crocodile and the taggerfish with its razor sharp teeth. From the Mekong River was the giant catfish and the freshwater stingray. We took a boat ride through an area of the zoo featuring animals from the Amazon. We saw some capybara, which are the largest rodents in the world, a flock of flamingos, a giant anteater, and other assorted creatures. Back in the aquarium, we saw some ugly looking eels and some innocent looking piranhas. We then came to my personal favorite, the manatees. These large gentle creatures are often called the sea cow, but we learned that they are more closely related to elephants. Even in the dim light, it's interesting to observe them eating vegetation with their round mouth that looks like a vacuum cleaner. The final excitement of the day was watching river otters as they waited patiently knowing that shortly they would be receiving their meal of fish that would be pushed through a slot in the door. They grabbed each fish as it fell from the slot and ran with them to an isolated point where they could eat their meal without fear of it being taken by another otter. As the otters enjoyed their lunch, we took our leave and returned to the ship. On our final day in Singapore, we took a bus tour of the city with stops at key locations. Our first destination was Faber Peak, the second highest hill in Singapore. It allowed us to view the city from a different perspective. From the top, you can take a cable car to the resort island of Sentosa, which features a Universal Studios theme park Faber Peak is a popular place for weddings, and one tradition is to have the wedding couple leave a brass bell attached to the railing. This is similar to Lovelocks in other cities. The bride and groom write a special message on the bell and leave it as a sign of their commitment. In the display area of the observation deck was a koi pond, which by itself is not unique. But sitting at the edge of the pond was a little boy petting a koi. The catfish seemed perfectly content to have him do it. Our next and last stop in Singapore was a visit to the National Orchid Garden. The park contains 1,000 species and 2,000 hybrid orchids. Walking through the park gives a feeling of being transported to another world where everything is peaceful and pristine. Every patch of ground was covered with flowering orchids, and the arrangement, delicacy, and variety were truly remarkable. Every turn in the path revealed another orchid species, distinct from all others and in perfect bloom. This meticulously maintained rainbow of color and beauty exceeded all of my expectations. One portion of the park honors famous people who have hybrid orchids dedicated to them. These include Angela Merkel, 
Prince William and Catherine, Laura Bush, and celebrities such as Elton John and Jackie Chan. Our tour of Singapore is over and we're back on the ship departing for Kuala Lumpur. We arrive the next morning in Port Kilang at the Bustad Cruise Center. From here it's a 45 minute bus ride to Kuala Lumpur. We pass industrial and commercial developments, arriving in a sprawling city having an urban population of 7 million. It's a visually stunning multicultural capital with influences from European colonialization and Chinese and Indian immigrants. As we approach the city center, we get a first glimpse at the KL Tower and the Petronas Towers. Our first destination is on top of a hill in the center of the city. We are at the KL Tower, which is a communications tower completed in 1995 that is 1,381 feet tall, making it the seventh highest tower in the world. In the lobby, we obtained our ticket and are ushered into an elevator, emerging onto a circular observation deck where the interior wall has a display of the 16 highest towers. Looking out, the first sight that comes into view is the Petronas Twin Towers. These 88-story buildings were completed in 1996 and were the tallest buildings in the world until 2004. We look down on them from our vantage point in the KL Tower because we're on top of a hill. Moving from window to window, we take in the rest of the city. While we do that, I'll share some of the early history of Kuala Lumpur. The word Kuala Lumpur means muddy confluence. It is at the confluence of the Klang River and the Gombak River, but there is disagreement about the reference to the term muddy. The original settlement was cut out of the jungle and established as a town in 1857 when the local Malay chief brought in workers to mine for tin. This location was the farthest up the Klang River that boats containing miners could travel. Many miners died from malaria, but the mine was successful when the town grew despite rival gangs, regional wars, flooding, and being burned to the ground in 1872 and again in 1881. Survival of the town through the many disasters is credited to Capitan Yap Aloy, the Chinese leader of the miners, and Frank Swiddenham, who was appointed as the resident minister from Britain. Together they rebuilt the town with wider streets and brick buildings. They reformed the laws and installed a sanitation system. By 1890 the town had grown to 20,000 and was selected as the regional capital. Back on the ground, we board our bus and travel to our next stop, the National Monument. Outside, we see a clean and bustling city that has a western feel about it. One notable unique feature of the city is its street lights. Each one is adorned with a representation of a hibiscus flower. The hibiscus is the national flower of Malaysia and has many practical uses in medicine and as a beverage. Arriving at the National Monument, we learn that there are actually two monuments. The first is a cenotaph originally erected by the British to commemorate those who fought in the First World War. After World War II, an inscription was added to recognize those who died in that war. The second monument was inspired by the U.S. Marine Corps War Memorial in Washington and was designed by the same sculptor, Felix de Walden. In 1966, it was unveiled and dedicated to the 11,000 Malaysians who died in what is called the Malaysian Emergency, which occurred from 1948 to 1960 and again from 1967 to 1989. This was a war waged against the communist guerrilla insurgency as they attempted to overthrow the British and take control of the country. Note the realism in the figures and the emotion in their faces. 
Our next stop was Independent Square, which is the home of the Royal Selangor Club and the site where the Malaysian government declared independence from Britain. It's also the site of the Baganan Sultan Abdul Samad building. The Salinger Club was formed in 1884 for high-ranking British society. The field in front was used for cricket, rugby, hockey, and football. It's now one of the oldest British institutions in the country. The raising of Malaysia's first flag of independence took place next to the field on August 30th, 1947. The Samad building was built in 1909 and is named after the Sultan who was in power at that time. It was originally the British government office and is now a Malaysian information center. It was designed in a Moorish style that was popular in India at that time. The style is sometimes referred to as the blood and bandages style due to the red bricks and the white plastered arches and banding. On our way back to the ship, we had one last brief stop at the Petronas Towers. Petronas is the government-owned petroleum and gas company, and the company is housed in one of the towers. The design of the towers is quite unique, incorporating Islamic influences. For our part, we must do what every tourist does when we visit this site, and have our picture taken, appearing to hold up the towers. <laughs> 